All right, so it is 8.11, let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome to the um, Emma Back to the South study course. Um, this course is uh, about uh, principally take, taking a look at the Getty manuscript, which founds the basis of our recruit curriculum. Um, taking a look at it to um, not only get a chance to study it for its own sake, but also to notice um, a lot of the things which we might not normally notice um, when we're training on the floor, when we're showing up to uh, class uh, during the week. Because there is a significant distance between what we're reading on the page and what ends up getting distilled and uh, experienced by you in, in drills on the cell floor. So it's always good to do both of those things in concert, reading the book, familiarizing yourself with the primary source, and also um, training. Um, we actually started this course um, 20 weeks ago, which seems crazy now. And I was just doing some maintenance on the videos today. And I, 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 I said something in like the, the third or fourth week um, about not being certain of our return in 2021. And um, I'm happy to say that our return in 2021 is looking better than it's ever been. So um, I really hope that we're gonna be able to get back into the cells um, this year across all of Emma. And that um, momentously joyous event is in the, um, it's in sight, it's on the horizon. So I won't say any more about that, otherwise we'll get emotional, but it's coming and I can't wait. Um, so this week is also a momentous week because we're starting the second half of the book. Um, so that's really good. But before we get into that, let me, I'll just finish the spiel. Um, so I'm principally leading this examination uh, through the Getty, though we are fortunate to have some of the um, uh, other free scholars that Emma join um, on occasion. Kel has been with us um, for a number of weeks now. So uh, a very big welcome to you, Kel, again. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Though you will be hearing my view and, and, and Kel's view and others, it's important that you know, of course, that our views are merely um, one of many. And we don't want you to believe something is the case just because we said it. Um, we want you to be convinced by the same evidence that convinces us about whatever we're saying. Um, lastly, this is, uh, you know, the, the privilege of being here live on these sessions so that you can ask questions. There's no dumb questions and chances are if you have a question, uh, three or five other people have it as well. So please feel free to ask any questions that you have. Um, uh, if if I don't let you get a word in edgewise or Kel doesn't just type in the chat and we'll see the question there, but don't don't be afraid to unmute and ask a question as we're, we're going through, all right? Um, okay, that's the end of the intro spiel. What is up for us today? So, so today, like I said, it's a momentous day. We're looking at the um, second half of the book of the Getty. And I say half um, because uh, we're gonna, um, we're gonna see, I hope, that though we often spend most of our time on the first half of the book, it is only half. And our recruit curriculum prejudices very heavily the first half of the book, principally because outside of whatever reason that Fiore has to show this stuff, we have the task of actually taking somebody who walks in off the street and turning them into a martial artist. And because of that, and because of the nature of the things in the second half of the book, which we're gonna get into today, the, um, the first half of the book is gonna be more, um, is more suited to new people than the second half of the book is. So most people have the most experience um, with the first half of the book. But that in no way is a value judgment on the first half of the book. It's not necessarily because it's more important per se or it's more fiore or anything like that. Um, it's, it's merely half. I think that's um, my general thesis for today. Now, we're going to be looking at the second half of the book today, and the second half of, of the Getty contains um, the armored section, as it were, the armored and equestrian uh, sections. I don't believe all of the figures in the equestrian section are in armor, but it's commonly thought of, well, these are all commonly thought of together, I, I think. 
And so the, arm, the armored section and equestrian sections comprise topics in sword and armor, uh, axe and armor, spear, and then mounted combat, both as the scholar on horseback and um, off and on foot against horseback. So that's what we have in store for us today, uh, or at least in the next number of weeks. Um, this will probably go faster than the first half of the book simply because of its nature. Because as we're going to discuss today, and we're going to talk all about armor today uh, to get us some context before we really start getting into this. Um, armor has a very unique and particular context in and of itself. And in order to understand what we're going to look at in the second half of the book, we not only have to understand everything that came before, but also armor. And it's because armor is everything but also that um, people commonly um, reflect that there isn't as many plays in the second half of the book as there are in the first half. Um, once we get through with our examination of armor, I'm sure that will become less mysterious. Um, but commonly this is, this is so, uh, or said to be so, because again, Fury has been building on what has come before this whole time. So in the dagger section, he built on the Abrazari that came before, and, and so on and so on throughout this book. And this continues in armor, although of course in armor, there are some things introduced that are new. Um, so, so in a way, uh, fighting in armor, we've seen a lot about fighting already, we talked all about fighting, and now in the armor section, we get um, furious commentary on sort of, you know, everything and, right? Armor and, and we're going to be looking at that and, and, and how the armor changes things and how it doesn't. So very exciting stuff. Um, okay. So before we, before we talk about the sword and armor, let's talk about armor. Let's say, let's say a few words about that. Um, so I think it would be rational, since Kel is here, um, for me to ask him to give us a, a synopsis of what he, what he thinks armor is all about. Um, how, you know, how armor, what armor adds to your experience as a fighter and some of its major attributes. Um, uh, and then if I have anything to add after that, which is unlikely, um, then maybe I'll do that. So Kel, are you up for that? Sure. Sweet. So um, yeah, I'll go ahead. So what's armor all about? What's this thing called armor? What is it? Well, by the time Fiori's treatise was put to paper, uh, armor had gone through a huge transition through the 14th century. At the beginning of the 14th century, most people were wearing mail over their entire body, different densities of mail, sometimes t-shirts of mail, uh, you know, a lot of different things. But principally, you had some hard spots at the elbows and the knees with like a disc or some kind of plane uh, shaped cup as it were. Um, <clears throat> but up until about the second quarter of the, uh, the 13th century, the 14th, 14th century, uh, 1300s as we think of it, they started adding more and more plates on. And it got to the point where it was becoming impossible for you to literally cut a man in armor. Uh, he was hardened at all, uh, at all points, even though substantially wearing mail as his backup. The whole purpose, of course, of armor, if you're not aware of it, is not to keep you completely safe from attack, but to allow you to take risk that you would never take out of armor. Um, the, the swords are still sharp, the uh, points are still hard, and um, in armor it's very, very, very difficult to get at a man without putting parts of the armor off or, or pulling it aside. Uh, the principal attacks against a man fully clothed in, in uh, male armor are pretty limited. You got to pull the shirt up and try to stab under his belly, uh, above the trousers. I mean, the, the, the trousers, uh, male chasses, as the proper term is, is um, you got to punch up under that stuff. You're not going to easily just jam uh, a point into it. Like you see in the in the movies where, or 
video games or whatever where you know one slashed with a sword and a guy in armor is cut in half no sorry that's just nonsense uh, when we look at famous uh, illustrations like the Machiavelli Bible or the Morgan Bible some people call it which was made in the, in the late 13th century you see you know the great heroes of the Bible doing absolutely heroic deeds splitting people in half you know and guts trailing out and all that kind of stuff People look at those illustrations and say, oh, look, it could be done. Well, no, they're illustrating the great heroes of the Bible, of, you know, of, of the archaic ages. The kind of, the Morgan Bible, Wikipedia there, you got, you had up, up there. In the, this one. Uh, yeah, there you go. This one, yeah. Yeah. Okay, anyway, point being, when you, you look at this, you have to look at the context that is given. This is... A very richly uh, involved Bible, and and most of these things are playing out important scenes from you know ancient times. So you can't take that at, at face value. By the same token, you can't absolutely dismiss it because a lot of the armor that they're wearing is the actual armor that was worn in that period by various people. But um, but the idea that armor could be easily defeated is just utterly foolish. The uh, best example of that would be the Battle of Luz in like 1244 something like that. All of the heavily armored men were on horses without any armor, just some sort of quilted cloth, mm. and they were all head to toe in mail. Um, of 1,100 left dead on the field, only four were knights like normal noblemen. Only four out of 1,100 dead. It's just, you know, it was a good time to be uh, this is you know, well favorite. armored yeah, yeah, there's a lot of really good ones. But, yeah. you know, when you look at stuff like this, take it from hey, its context. When we yeah. look at later period armor, especially into the late 14th and early 15th century, if the armor looks really bizarre, like there's some kind of strange epaulets on it, and, and, you know, it just doesn't look like it should be, look and see if that's part of a biblical illustration, because they might be showing what their imagination of a Roman soldier was. Right. Right. Now moving moving on from this later period, in Fiore's time, even when Fiore he was a young man, solid plate <coughs> breastplates were just coming on. I mean, everything up until that point was what we like to call a coat of plates, which is the pe people in that period called a pair of plates, but you had a front and a back to it. Um, this armor was difficult to penetrate, and, and as this armor became more and more solid on the torso, and better helmets were, were, you know, selected, various helmet styles were selected. Arm harness got heavier. Leg harness was always well uh, well defended, if only with mail and padding. Simple reason, they typically rode knee to knee with their colleagues. So you had to protect your legs. It's not so much about someone slapping at you from the ground as when you're riding in, in unit together with the coach lances, the next guy beside you is, is like literally rubbing his knees against your knees. So you've got to have protection there. And you find that some sort of knee protection is one of the first things that gets developed in the 14th century and, and even a little bit before. Now, when we get to uh, Fiori's time, these guys here are looking at very early 15th century armor in the Getty. Very, very early. Um, and this is one of the reasons we know this is an early manuscript because of the, the, the harness in it. Italians in this period were still wearing, uh, say, a solid breastplate and some sort of um, coat of plates type, like loose plates under a cloth foundation on their on their back to protect their spine. And they're still wearing full shirts of mail or, or a shortened shirt called a habergeon. The helmets got heavier and heavier. Now, a, a lot of people look at these illustrations and... Um, they look at the, the helmet on the first, these first two plates here. They go, well, that's a jousting helmet. No, it's not right. No, it's, it's pretty much been proven in, in the last 10 years with really good access to high-rise uh, images yeah. of various art that these, these helmets were a very common foot harness type helmet. Yeah. yeah. There's one uh, just like that. It's the one that I want, uh, Kel. I gotta, uh, Anthony has the same, the same one. Um, I think um, Anthony Laviola, uh, where is it here? So, okay. Uh, I'm just finding it. Well, so. well okay. Any, anyway, it's, it's, it's helmets like this, helmets like these cloth visor, uh, mm -hmm. they're, they they're right, only, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, 
some people call them a shovel face or a plow face. Mm -hmm. It's a fairly common shape, uh, although not all of them had uh, movable visors. Uh, this is mm -hmm. this particular one here is um, would be really tough to uh, to find a piece of art that shows a helmet like that mm -hmm. in its the way it's built for safety. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they didn't bother with that kind of stuff because they they knew how to build a helmet so that. The visor wouldn't fly up easily, but you could still get it to go up. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, as far as armor goes, it's a it's a secondary defense. Your skill at arms is your primary defense. Yeah. So, so Cal, how does um, uh, what does armor change on a fighter, and what does it not change in your view? Okay. Uh, two major things. Visibility drops to about fifteen percent, depending on the type of. Uh, helmet visor you have or if you even have a visor there are an awful lot of illustrations of people going into battle without uh, mm -hmm. a visor simply so they could see and breathe those people often got shot in the face with arrows <laughs> uh, uh, yeah it wasn't a common thing if you were, if the French were facing the English after Cressy they never went without a visor never whereas a lot of the English did go without visors because they weren't worried about the French shooting them yeah, the the, uh, long, the long bowman would mop up the crossbowman long before, uh, you know, he came to blows. So. The the one uh, a record in Agincourt has the describes the French knights when they when they came into the first time as like leaning into the hail of arrows. Yeah, point like looking at the ground because yeah. they're also mar marching in pretty tight formation. They weren't like a, a mm -hmm. loose gag of guys. These mm -hmm. they were practically on top of each other, and when one fell in the mud. They got stomped on and, and they drowned. Mm -hmm. You know, another uh, thing that the hail of arrows that was coming at them was ferocious from either side. So mm -hmm. the guys on the outside were selected to have, you know, who had the best armor was mm -hmm. on the outside uh, of the flanks, and, and they still got pounded because mm -hmm. a longbow at you know say 50 paces or something like that, flat shooting, is going to go through mail. It's mm -hmm. going to go through joints and harness. Period. Uh, whether it'll penetrate the front of a breastplate, doubtful, but definitely the sides, because armor isn't, unlike today, real medieval armor is thinner at the edges that put the weight where they needed it. So if you had 14 pounds of breastplate uh, made last year and 14 pounds of breastplate made in the early 15th century, you wouldn't be able to shoot through the front of it. You'd be able to easily shoot through the sides or at the, at the shoulder or whatever, because it's much thinner there. The same thing with arm harness. I've seen people wear 16 gauge modern arm harness. Uh, that's heavier than anything that was ever made in the medieval period. Mm -hmm. Even jousting armor wasn't that thick. And you have to remember too that when you look at some of these incredibly heavy assemblage of armor in museums, mm -hmm. that they are in fact sporting armor. They're jousting armor. That's the equivalent of you know right. American style football equipment mm -hmm. versus uh, Aussie rules where real men play. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so uh, what was the second part of your question? So, uh, yeah, I said, um, so what does armor change about a fighter, uh, and then what doesn't it change? Okay, visibility, uh, first of all, breathing, secondly, and the, the last and most easily disregarded, like the people don't think of it, although it's very, very important, is the center of balance on the average man is around your sternum when you put full harness on uh, your center of balance now goes up to your throat so you can't let you can't bend over and pick daisies in harness without having a lot of strain on your back because you've got a lot more metal above your shoulders than um, you know than you're accustomed to having and that adds a fair bit of weight uh, and wrecks your balance to compensate for that you need a deeper stance you need to have good solid footing and this is not dance around on your toes stuff uh, most of the time in armor you're going to pivot on a bent foot uh, raised foot but you're not going to uh, launch from it you're not going to launch off your toe and do a lunge type of thing because you can't accelerate that mass as easily unless you're really really accustomed to fighting in armor and I'm talking two three times a week at the least to with your full armor on so that you can you can be active in harness. Uh, those of you that have trained in harness at Emma, uh, the scholars that have 
trained there will, will all tell you how radically your balance shifts and how much easier it is to be thrown mm -hmm. uh, to lose your balance type of thing so um, those are those are things that are immediately noticeable for someone that's never worn harness uh, that thinks that it, it's, it's more about you know not being bashed it's really more about not falling down because you can get stabbed in harness really hard and move with the blow and it won't penetrate your harness and it may not even dent it there's mm -hmm. when you're on the ground and someone stabs you you are not going anywhere your armor is going to take the full force of it against the earth so earlier on in the abrazari section where fury says and i will hurl you into the earth uh, he's not talking about throwing you for a sprawl he's talking about like tent pegging you into the ground fully in armor it's pretty easy to do just take someone's foot up and down they go and they go down on yeah. there's a lot of extra mass so that is the the primary three things that uh, full harness will do to you a full harness of this period obviously a full harness of the a, a period like say the 11th century norman type armor mm -hmm. you got a, a, an open face so you don't have the breathing problems you're wearing about two-thirds as much weight in metal but it's all flexible metal None of it's going to absorb a, a punishing blunt uh, blow, like say from a mace or an axe that doesn't penetrate. Whereas, you know, swords don't aren't going to really do that too much. They're going to break bones and crush muscles and stuff like that. Mm. But once you've got into full plate arms and plate legs, uh, especially with a good solid breastplate on it, the only spots that are really available as targets for a point are the, the face, throat, under the arms, uh, in the groin. If, generally, if you can get someone, you know, to turn to their back, you can get a better shot at it because people tend not to have a, as much armor on their back as they do on their, on their front because it's kind of disgraceful to turn your back in, in combat. Yeah. So in for, modern, uh, modern terms, it's not mm. uh, modern terms. It's not as easily understandable. But back then, it would be complete loss of reputation. Like people would shun you. They'd call you a coward. For turning your back in in a mm -hmm. fight, mm -hmm. backing up backing up in a fight was really only a respectable thing if you were fighting two or three people. You should never give ground if you're fighting one person. So, uh, so in summary, uh, your balance changes when you're in armor uh, versus without, from your core to your um, your 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 upper chest. Um, your vision is drastically reduced to around uh, fifteen percent. You said, and uh, on average, yeah. yeah, on average. And um, the third thing you said was, uh, shit, I just forgot. Was it targeting? No, it was there was a third thing. Breathing. Breathing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Your breathing. That's right. Your breathing is um, much more difficult. So, um, so these are the things that. Um, that, that Kel is saying that change the circumstance from being out of armor uh, to being in armor. Um, but you'll notice that what Kel immediately didn't go to is he didn't say, well, the fighting changes. You know what I mean? He didn't say the techniques change or the you know physics change or whatever. He said, well, okay, it's harder to breathe, it's harder to see, and the targeting is different. Right, um, you know, and your balance changes, right? But uh, and what doesn't change is what you know, right? What you know about the art um, and your postas and your, you know, your, your your skills. None of that changes. But because of what does change, it's more difficult to do the things that you know. Um, unless, of course, you spend so much time in armor that you know, uh, there's no impediment to the armor, right? But I want to just rest on this point a second, and, and uh, I want your commentary, of course, to Kel, because we'd be remiss starting off this second half of the book without making this point, and that is there is a very, very common misconception about armor in the modern world, um, mostly fed by movies and TV shows and our own cultural myths and legends or whatever, but it's specifically that armor is made to protect you right as opposed to what kel said kel said armor allows you to take risk right now that's not the same thing 
Those are very different things. You know, and people are armored up not in order to take punishment, right? Like, you know, you don't use a shield in order to have somebody hit it as hard as they can. You're using it to, to take risk and give yourself an advantage. And armor is, uh, is of that same thing. So um, the common misconception is that armor is designed, you know, it's supposed to be taking a beating. And therefore, when you're in armor, you're somehow safer than out of armor. In the broadest of senses, that's true in that, like we talked about, the targeting is different, right? But we'll see, uh, well, we, are, we already saw in the dagger section, right? And Fiori will mention it elsewhere that the dagger is a deadly uh, danger to armor. Extremely deadly. And these, these, these it, weapons... It so, is hmm? quite literally the worst thing to deal with because you can yeah. see a pole axe, you can right. see a lance. It's almost impossible to see a dagger in someone's hand in armor. Yeah. Until you yeah. realize that they're they're moving to something at the middle of their body, they no longer have a long weapon. That's when you really have to tighten up and figure out what they're up to. Because if they're yeah. if they've got a, a some secondary weapon, a dagger on them, they're gonna pull it, which there'll be a moment where you're not under attack. Right. And then suddenly a horrific attack. Whereas if they don't have a weapon to back up and they've lost their long weapon, they're going to wrestle with you immediately. And that's, mm -hmm. that's your first sign that you best be looking out for one of those pointy things right now. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, so the dagger is of critical danger to armor, but also it's not as if the axe is not of critical danger. The axe is an absolutely terrifying weapon. I would, it's an abs, you know, it's, it's an absolutely impossibly terrifying weapon and it's disgusting in every way and you know it, it's designed to make a person in armor you know feel unsafe you know what i mean like so much for your armor the sword and armor the sword can defeat armor fine but the axe you know the axe is an absolutely terrifying can opener and the spear is is brutal too right you know one of humanity's oldest weapons can defeat armor uh very well so it's not as if the armor is made to as it were protect you Proof right you. yeah and and this um this mistake uh, it's an honest mistake for modern people uh you know uh, we don't have experience in armor so you know why how would we know that unless we studied it but this is obvious uh or this is an obvious mistake in so many medieval time enthusiast activities and i say that as as broad of a shotgun blast as possible. So, you know, um, if you guys have ever heard of the IMAF, the or the um, Battle of Nations, or anybody anywhere who fights in armor, right? Anybody anywhere who fights in armor, except occasionally the right places in the human community, and I make that very specific uh, distinction, Usually they're fighting in armor, these people who are fighting in armor, they're fighting in armor having started from nothing. So they're not in armor, they're not a fighter, right? They don't, they're not approaching armor as if it's something to layer on top of a martial system that they're already competent in. They're beginning with armor. And why this is uh, crazy is that at least with, with how Fiore appears to be describing this art, right? That the armor is the culmination. It's the epitome of this martial expression. It's everything before and, right? It's being an expert in all of this shit first and then reducing your vision by 15%, making it so that you can't really feel much in the, on your outside world, laying yourself in steel, you know, putting that extra fitness requirement on you, right? Making your breathing harder, changing your center of balance, and having you still be able to defend yourself and still be able to effectively fight. That's an incredible martial challenge. And there ought to be no doubt, I, I submit in anyone's mind, that the nature of armor simply shows that it is the, the epitome of martial expression of this, this art we're talking about, right? It's not... I, don't, I really don't believe that's a negotiable uh, point from my view, right? Obviously, I'm making the argument. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm in good company here. But there's so many pe people in so many places out there that view it as equivalent, right? They view the first half of this book, as it were, the subject of it, as equivalent to the second half, 
you know, you can find out of armor, fine if that's your thing. You can find inner armor, fine if that's your thing, right? And if we're studying Fiore and trying to, you know, learn what Fiore thinks about it, him being someone who lived at a time when you did this in earnest, Fiore is going to show us, I submit, that the nature of armor is such that we see this as the epitome of martial expression and therefore impossible to realistically do unless you already know how to fight. Plain and simple. If you don't know all this stuff, if you can't fight well before, how are you going to fight when your vision's 15%, your breathing is cut in half, you know, your ability to breathe is reduced, you can't really feel the outside world, you know, how, how, how are you going to do it? So that's point, uh, that's major point number one, right? And it's, and it's also, might I add, um, um, it also ought to be present in our minds as students of Emma. Because we we ought not make the we ought not make the I don't know assumption or whatever that this is enough of the art you know that the art is can be sufficiently expressed here right or that this is you know we can see all of it here this is you know the art can be expressed in this context but it it lives in in its entirety right all of that and expressed in armor. And it's important, I think, that everyone has, at least in the vaguest, you know, recesses of their mind, a goal to experience armor, right? A goal to, to get there. It doesn't even have to be necessarily even in earnest in the lists, right? Because that is a significant physical feat in and of itself, and not everybody is capable of that, right? And it's also a financial commitment to get this kind of armor, and not everybody has that that freedom and I get that but if you never want to get into it you'll never get into it right if you never want to experience it you'll never experience it and um, you know to experience the whole of Fiori's art you you know you need to get an armor at some point you need to spend some time in armor you right? need to ride horses once in a while too that and that as well absolutely you know uh, i can't wait till we get to the mounted section and equestrian uh skills are definitely part of this right they're definitely part of the class of individual that fiore was in the middle ages um you know it's sadly something that a lot of us don't have with few exceptions of course um, which is which is great and we're gonna have to learn from those people who have equestrian uh, skills and in background but you know when emma picked this manuscript they picked it as the earliest complete martial manuscript in Europe. And by complete, we really mean it's complete. It's got all of this and armor and horseback. So if you're looking for one image of what a fighter is, you know, uh, Fiore, it gives you a damn good opinion, right? It's only one man's view, that's true, but it gives you a damn good opinion. And most other martial manuscripts don't give you that same holistic view, right? You have to shop through for a bunch of manuscripts. I'm thinking particularly of the Germans, um, but uh, you know, you could collectively in the German corpus get this, you know, uh, get a vision here. But it's not going to be from the same man in the same book. So this is pretty powerful, and and you or know, even the same century. Yeah, exactly. Or even the same century, right? So this is kind of to hype up what we're about to look at. We've been building to this for 20 weeks, right? And we're only halfway through the uh, the manuscript. Um, all right, what else is there to say? Oh yeah, um, just to kind of underline the point about how to defeat armor. And this also kind of riffs off my, my shotgun blast against modern uh, medieval enthusiasts who are in armor. So armor, you know, again, it's not meant, as Kel said, to protect you per se, to, to, to proof you against blows. Um, not least because it's it's reasonably defeated, right? Now, yes, it's true that armor uh, is often proof against cuts, but it's not proof against thrusts, particularly thrusts again in the right places, right? In the back of the legs, you know, or in the ass, where if it's not protected, in the groin, in the armpits, in the face, with small thrusting weapons, with big weapons, spears, swords can thrust. Right, pole axes can, can can thrust a bit too. Um, it is, 
Yeah, and, and it's uh, so I say actors have some sort of prepping ability. Yeah, so every and, class of them. That's right, and 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 uh, it, so it's not proof against thrusts, and it's also not proof against crushing, right? The axe can do both, um, you know, but crushing blows, um, maces, axes, things like uh, things like that, they can also defeat armor, right? So, you know, uh, one of the things that you often find in medieval enthusiast circles that experience armor is you find <laughs> rules to prohibit the very thing that defeats the armor, right? So they'll say, put on armor and hack away at each other, but no thrusting because that's dangerous. Well, that, that, that to me just blows my mind. I don't really understand that logic, but fine, okay. But that's, that, you know, that's a thing that people do. And you know, why, why am I talking about it, right? Why does it even matter what other people do? We wanna make sure that we disabuse ourselves of the instincts and the suppositions we have about armor before we get into it. And we try, we, we don't wanna carry those into the art, right? Um, or have those floating around. And the fact that armor is defeatable, reasonably defeatable by thrusts and crushing, underscores the notion that armor isn't about absorbing blows, proofing you against blows. Right, it's about putting a layer of protection uh, on an already expert fighter to allow them to take risk, which would be inappropriate for them to take out of armor. So now you, you so you put this you put this layer of, of protection on an expert fighter. They're an expert. You try to if you try to kill them, they'll be able to kill you too. But they can move. They can shift in this armor. Um, they already have all their skills. Their art is their defense, not the armor. Their art is their defense. And also, if you happen to nick them or actually hit them once or twice or whatever, chances are the armor will, will uh, take the worst of it. So that's a pretty deadly combination, right, of having an expert man uh, uh, at arms in a suit of armor that proves them against a lot of incidentals and whatnot. And this Fury is what Fiora is about to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yuri has something to say in his prologue when he's talking about uh, mm -hmm. fighting and, yes. and, and uh, uh, I can't remember exactly where it is in the prologue, but basically what he says is, I would rather fight in the list than it's fully armed. Mm -hmm. I would rather fight in the list three times than to fight once with sharp swords and Zuccarello, the army coat, and, and soft gloves, mm -hmm. which he had to do five times for, you know, he, he fought five duels and was not wounded. Uh, and he says, I'd rather fight three times in, in the list because you could take many blows and still win the day. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's saying that it's not that it's perfectly safe, but it's just a lot less risky. Right? It, yeah, it, allow, so, it allows you to make some, to, to make some mistakes um, and, and, and recover from them. It allows them to hit you, you know, uh, but th that hit to not be fatal, as opposed to, say, in, you know, in Largo and Strutto, out of armor, uh, kind of what we were talking about um, when we were talking about Largo and Strutto was Largo kind of allows you the... Largo allows you some, some space, which equals time, to make mistakes and recover from them. It doesn't allow you to make mistakes per se if you fucking you can get hit. And if you're in Largo, you know, with sharp weapons, you're going to get limbs chopped off or, or killed, right? Strato has less space, therefore less time, therefore there's less, you know, opportunity to make mistakes and recover from them. But that's out of armor. Still, when you're out of armor, you don't want to make mistakes. You can't really afford to make mistakes. In armor, you can afford to have things go a little bit sideways sometimes, right? And the armor can be, can be there for you. Yeah. Uh, not that you'd count on it for that, of course. It's just extra proof, right? Your art is your main, your main defense. Okay. Um, so so let, there we go. Let's start the study of uh, this subset of, uh, mm -hmm. of armistari. Yeah. So enough about enough about armor and context. Thank you very much, Kel. That was excellent. I hope those professor comments were were useful. So the first section of the, um, in this second half of the book is a sword and armor section, starting at thirty two VA. And like the sections that are going to come after, we're going to see it's got guards and plays. And then we have this little bit on the two swords, which we already discussed in the previous class. So let's get into the guards. 
um, and also talk about the sword and armor. So, all right, the sword and armor, um, we already know a lot about the, the, the sword um, because we've dealt with it substantially throughout the book already in the sword and two hand section and also in the sword and one hand section. It's not the case that the sword in one hand is a different sword and the sword in two hands it's the same weapon. And we also saw the sword in the dagger and sword section. So we've seen it everywhere, we've learned a lot about it. Um, we saw um, similar, what we're going to see, we saw similar guards in the first six, uh, these first six guards here. We saw similar guards to what we're going to end up looking at with the sword and armor section, which is interesting. And we've also seen a number of times where the sword was gripped in two hands, um, one hand on the blade and one hand on the hilt. We've seen it in the 11th Scholar, Folio 21 BC, in the sword in one hand section. And we also saw it in Stretto and, 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 and in other places. So the sword and armor, yes, we're going to be holding the sword in, with the right hand on the hilt, and the left hand is going to be on the blade often, but we're in armor. So using the sword in two hands and that in armor, and that's where we start. And we start with the guards. So the six guards, um, Posta Breve la Serpentina, Vero Croce, Serpentino lo Soprano, Porta di Ferro la Mazzana, Posta Sagittaria, and um, Croce Bastarda. So let's get into it. All right, Folio 32 VA, for those of you following, in the Getty, who's our first guy. Andrew, sir, would you like to read the text for us, please, and thank you. Hey, we are six masters who know how to fight. Each of us knows this art well. Handheld weapons give us no worry, and we defend handily against cuts and thrusts that may come our way. I am the post of Breve La Serpentina, and I consider myself better than the others. If I give you a thrust, you'll surely bear the mark. Thank you, sir. All right, Short Serpent. Um, we are six masters who know well how to fight. <laughs> Each of us knows this are well. Well, um, there we go. There we go. Um, these guys are not new. They know their art well. Um, short Serpent. Handheld weapons give us no worry. We defend easily against everything. Um, and post a uh, breve la serpentina, short serpent, considers himself better than the others. And if I give you a thrust, you'll bear the mark. So I don't really know what to make of that better bit. I don't know if that's Fiore saying that he thinks this is better than the others. I don't know if you have an opinion on that, Kel, but it's, it's a great guard standard and sword in two hands. It's a, a very common fighting position. You can get at all all of the major targets uh, with this. Mm. It's uh, very strong like a spear thrust because you're stabilizing the blade in the middle. Mm -hmm. It's uh, extremely accurate. It's much easier to place a point on target with your hand in the middle of, of the, uh, or you say your offhand in the middle of the blade than it is to with both hands on the handle. Um, although he does include middle iron gate in here because it, it is a really really helpful play uh set up for play as we'll see in the bullock section but i'm not going to go into it very much here this this particular guard controls the center line like kind of like breve does uh, out of armor um, but it has more variability more, more um, of an instabile nature than because it can you know, move around very very quickly but it is short, right? So it's a short striking and covering defensive position where you can reach out uh, a certain amount, but not not over over carry yourself, not over commit commit yourself. Whereas uh, full uh, middle iron gate is the position where you can become over committed fairly easily, but it has many many other strengths. Uh, as far as short serpent goes, I have to say that it's this and Bastard Cross are my two strongest mm. and most comfortable positions. Yeah, and we'll see, um, uh, maybe we'll, we'll see that these plays flow very easily into the next, uh, into each other. Um, so, you know, uh, Short Serpent, High Serpent, Bastard Cross, you know, True Cross also, they, they flow very well together. I, I kind of think of, um, 
Middle Iron Gate and Sagittarius a bit of outliers, I guess. I don't know if you agree with that, Kel, but these four certainly they're like the, the bread and butter of uh of of fighting an arm with the sword. Um yeah, okay. I don't know if there's really much else to say. This is uh, this is it, right? Uh, low serpent. Short serpent. Short serpent, sorry. Short serpent. Yeah, a lot of people get confused with that. Same with mm. the same with um, uh, Ligatura Mezana, right? There's mm. there's one there's one that he shows, and this is a lower key, and then he shows a better one, which he calls Chiava Forteza, the strong lower key, right? And people say, well, there's a weak lower key and a strong lower key. No, 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 no. There's a lower key and a strong lower key. You know, like, just better. But the other one's good, too. So, in this particular case, you know, comparing one poster to another as which is better, well, he puts it in the in the first because it's it's the way to get your point forward into the into the opponent um, right smartly. Uh, the others are a little more challenging. They're they're remedy masters. They're not as easily attack. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not a straight on attack. For example, when we get to the set, the next one, um, it's it's a, a lying in wait position. It's not somewhere that you go after exchanging three blows. Uh, you have to do this a little bit out of, out of measure. It's also okay. the case that um, these postas oppose each other on the page. One on the 32 VA, which means this is in the top top uh, left of a page. This is in the top right. This is in the bottom left. This is in the bottom right. So these two uh, figures oppose each other. These two figures oppose each other. And these two figures oppose each other. So that's also kind of an interesting way to look at these Posters. Although I don't think he talks about the opposition in the text, but it's there. Um, but anyway, if you it, like, like a couple of um, posta and uh, sword in two hand, say if you're in Finestra and you simply turn both mm -hmm. of you face the other way, you're in another posta, mm. right? You're in Finestra one way, you're in posta uh, Didona uh, the other way. This is a similar thing. If you are fighting in the round, you can go from short serpent to true cross simply by shifting your your head back. Like you're you're going to look uh, backwards instead of forwards. It's not that much different. You're going to move your hands a little bit. That's right. That's but right. you can reverse into either one of these things uh, in, at will. So mm -hmm. this is another proof that Fiori is not a linear. It's mm -hmm. fighting. Uh, Opponents from any direction. Uh, yeah, and, and so so that brings us to, to true cross. I'll take a snip. We'll use that in a second. Um, but let's let's read the text here. Uh, let's who's next. Anthony, would you like to read the text for us, sir, please? Sure. I want to use the Polsta di Vera Croce true cross position against you. Your thrust cannot reach me. I will parry while passing and strike you without fail with a thrust. Neither you nor the other guards worry me much. I know my fighting pretty well, and I can't fail my crossing. For this is what the art requires you to do without screwing up, passing, crossing, and striking. Thank you very much. All right. So there's a lot here, actually. Um, first of all, what is the posta? So as Kel said, true cross is very similar to um, short serpent. And the image in true cross is an image of a, a, a figure uh, who has done a volta stabile. Okay, so whenever we see these refused positions um, in, uh, in the text, um, at least as, as I read it, of course, um, it's always important to remember that the, po the posta is refused. So, which means that if he's unrefused, right, uh, facing the same direction, of course, then this sword is on the left side. Now, what makes this true cross is going to be the handedness of the offhand. So, on the left side, if the thumb is pointing towards the point, that's true cross. If the thumb is pointing inwards, that's bastard cross. Okay, and we're going to see that in the last post. -up. But if you notice, it, the, the stance is completely different too. Uh, it, 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 um, the the reason that they're crosses is they form crosses. They're not um, they're, you know, a, a religious yeah. badge. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and, and you'll, you'll notice in, in Short Serpent that the thumb in Short Serpent is uh, pointing to the, uh, to the point here. Um, so this is, this is why uh, Cal, Cal said exactly right here, I think, that they're very similar. They're almost the same poster, right? Thumb pointing towards the, towards the point, grasped in the middle of the blade, except here it is, the sword is on the, um, the player's left side, and in the Short Serpent it was on his right. Um, but but there we go. Okay. Um, now the text on the uh, true cross. You thrust cannot reach me. I'll parry while passing and strike you without fail. That's going to be important um, in the end when we get to the plays. The other guards don't worry me much. I know my fighting pretty well, etc. etc. This is what the art requires you to do: passing, crossing, and striking. This is a fascinating little piece of, of instruction because it, it actually is an instruction, right? Um, that's present in the posters. These things you'd miss if you didn't read the posters, right? So uh, this is something that we can take as a general description of what we're going to end up doing in armor, sword and armor, uh, well, uh, specifically, although it's, I'm sure it's more, it's more general to armor. Passing. Uh, well, really, it's crossing, passing, and striking in, in, that, in that order. Uh, but this is, this is what's, what's, what's going to end up happening. Receiving a blow in the play, passing towards the enemy, and then striking with, uh, with our button. So awesome. We learned a lot in this, in this little poster. And this is true cross. All right. Let's move on. Hi, Serpent. 32 VC in the Getty. This is also the uh, the Excalibur armor figure. Uh, this must be why Brian loves that movie so much. Uh, don't you think, Kel? Well, the sex and armor seems pretty good, too. <laughs> it's just the, the spikes. This, you know, the, the, if, you, if anybody's watched the movie Excalibur, every, <laughs> every scene of armor has got spikes everywhere. Just, just spikes on all surfaces, and whenever I see, I see this this image, I just laugh. Just yeah, it's just so funny. But hey, this image with spikes, look at that. Um, all right, <laughs> hi, sir. Okay. A couple things to uh, look at before we talk about the mm -hmm. information and the facts. Mm -hmm. A lot of people go, how on earth do you lift your arm harness high enough to get your sword behind your helmet? Well. If you've ever tried it, it's almost impossible. Uh, if, the, if your upper body armor isn't really flexible enough, uh, really can't get your arms that far back past your shoulders. The reason that this uh, sword is shown behind the head, or specifically behind the crown, is because the last piece of any illuminated manuscript to be done is the gilding. So when the gold is a uh, gold leaf is applied, it's the very very last thing is done. So it looks like he's got it hiding behind his head. The figure was drawn with the sword uh, just at the top of the helmet, and then they painted it over with a gold crown. So for anyone that says, you know, oh, that's crazy, you can't do that. Well, it's just the way the art was done. Yeah. This this play, um, I never never have bother trying to put my sword any higher than the crown of my helmet like literally the front plate above my visor mm -hmm. is as far as the sword goes because you don't need it to go any farther yeah. Yeah. anyways now now continue please thank you Cal. Uh, all right let's yeah let's give us a quick read bd would you like to read the text i am the serpentine lo soprano high serpent high and well armed I throw strong, underhanded thrusts since I am high, and get back low. I'll throw a good thrust while passing. I know my art well. I couldn't care less about your cuts since I know my stuff, and I can give you a good dose of thrusts. Thank you very much, Beanie. All right, so um, the typical Fiore Sass, um, he's high, well-armed, and he knows his art well, etc., etc., I throw strong underhanded thrusts since I am high and get back low. I also throw a good thrust while passing. 
So this is a little counterintuitive at first read to most people because you'd think that, you know, the, the, the attack naturally comes from the poster that it begins in. So you'd think that, you know, Low Serpent, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, Short Serpent would have the thrust from below, as it were, and High Serpent would have the thrust from high, right? But in the text, Fury says, I throw strong underhanded thrusts since I am high and get back low. I certainly read this as him not saying you only throw low strikes from here, but that you can definitely throw low strikes from here, specifically by transitioning through <laughs> Short Serpent. Uh, but, you know, Short Serpent and High Serpent are the same, you know, the same snake, as it were. Yes, you can, um, you can do high thrusts, but remember that armor tends to be weaker from below than from above. And actually, um, one of the more, it's not uncommon to see thrusts, high thrusts in Emma uh, in armor because high thrusts are relatively safe to make. They don't have that big of a chance of skipping underneath aventails, skipping underneath plates, you know, whereas these low thrusts definitely do, right? Well, they're meant to seek those places. So obviously they're dangerous. Um, so yes, you can throw these high thrusts here, but you can also transition and throw a devastatingly brutal low thrust as well. Um, from under Quick question. Yes. The hand in low serpent, the thumb is pointing forward. Uh -huh. In this one, it's, it's reversed. How That's does right. that... Right, that so that's, that's a good question, yeah. Um, I don't think that substantially affects uh, the nature of the poster, myself. Uh, what, what do you think, Kill? Yeah, oh, absolutely. It certainly does. Mm -hmm. the, the leverage that you have with your thumbs pointed in is substantial in the center. When your mm -hmm. thumbs pointed out, you don't have nearly as much leverage, but you have much more point control. Uh, this particular mm -hmm. guard is a is a cover guard like you're you're you don't necessarily attack straight out of here you're going to counter mm. with this you're it's obviously a provocation i mean look at the stance right mm. so as a provocation if you get someone trying to you know do the common fencer thing of, of tossing a fendente at your at your forward arm or whatever um you can either decide whether you want to take it on your van brace and some left van braces in italian armor um a little bit later period than this but some of them are substantially stronger on the left because that's your mm. bridle hand right you don't want your bridle arm cut mm. because you've got to control the horse now in this particular case having your thumbs facing in which is also the case with uh, bastard. bastard cross mm -hmm. um, gives you a lot more leverage through the center so your your strength against uh, a blow of some sort or your ability to swat at something with the entire space between your hands is very high. So if someone takes a low thrust at you as you're leaving a, a huge opening for them to do, you can bring your arms down in this position and still toss a heavy thrust. But you can also put it as a lever to throw your opponent around. If you're holding the sword with your thumbs in, you have enormous leverage potential that you do not have with your thumbs pointed forward. Simple. If you've ever used a shovel, you can use a, a, a shovel to pick up a big clump of dirt or a rock or whatever and move it with your thumbs pointed together and using it as a simple lever. But if you... Um, you have one up and one down and you've got to do a lot of the work with your back and your legs right to get the same amount of energy out of it it's a physiological position that gives you an advantage yeah that makes that makes sense yeah so there you uh, there you go does that answer your question bruce bruce yeah yeah thank you okay good he was just uh unmuting himself thank you very much bruce, no, that's, for the question. That's fine. um Maybe we should take a second here to pause and see if there's any other questions hanging around. Any other outstanding questions? Did so you hear? Uh, 
I would have a question. It's more, probably more appropriate for Wednesday and how this handedness would um, then correspond to our actions in Spear. Yeah, we haven't gotten yeah. to Spear yet. So maybe that's more of a Wednesday thing. But right. definitely yeah. put, a, put a pin in that, please. Also, uh, please I'd, I'd like to make a comment for Beatty. Uh, Beatty sent me uh, a few notes and questions uh, after last Monday's session that were, were really more appropriate uh, for the, the Wednesday night session mm. with the scholars, but we didn't get that far, so I didn't have a chance to pop those in. And I'd like to begin Wednesday night with answering those questions. So they're excellent questions, sure. and they're fairly easily answered. Great. Anyways, good job, Petey, on that. I'm sorry that I just want to explain why you haven't heard anything back from it. Awesome. Yeah, I can't wait till uh, can't wait till Wednesday. Okay. Um, okay. okay. So yeah, all right. I think that's that's uh, pretty much it for High Serpent, thirty-two well, VC. Uh, did anyone else have questions? Yeah, on the same. Yeah, I'm looking at Discord. No, nobody's unmuted. Okay, we'll continue on. If you do, of course, please please do unmute and speak up. All right. Next one, thirty-two VD, Middle Iron Gate. Uh, Bruce, would you like to read this text? Please and thank you. Uh, second edition. They call me the Porta di Ferro Mezzana, since both in and out of armor I deliver strong thrusts and pass off line with my left foot while giving your face a good taste of the point of my sword. I can also place the point and edge of my sword between your arms, putting you in a middle bind like the one pictured and named earlier. Thank you very much, Bruce. All right. So here's an interesting poster that we might not have expected to see, but we are. 32 VD, we have sword and armor. We have a poster from the uh, sword and two hand section drawn out of armor. So a middle iron gate is a fantastic poster out of armor. It's very suited to the the, the fencing that you do, but here it is with the sword in armor. Um, and unlike all of the other posta in this in, the, uh, in this pair of uh, this this group of six, both hands are on the hilt. So um, I certainly read this as saying, "Look, you're still holding a sword. Just because you're in armor doesn't necessarily mean you're fighting people in armor." You know, if the if the situation is appropriate sure fine give a cut right nothing's stopping you right it's still a sword and it's also suitable for thrusting right you can give good thrust stout thrust in this uh, posta with good range right although of course as Kel said you have to make sure you don't overcommit. that's absolutely the case but there's nothing preventing you from you using this posta for what it's good for right um so so fine right we Here's a post that we've seen before. We kind of know its properties of what it can do. Fiori gives that to us, uh, gives it to us again, so that we don't forget. Um, he also gives us a, a window into what we might be doing with a sword in two hands, uh, in, in armor. Placing the point of my sword between your arms and putting you in a middle bind. Right, we've seen middle binds before. We know them very well, but we're going to see some cool ones with the sword. In, in the in the near future. In in terms of that, if you could go back to High Serpent for a moment. Sure. Okay. When you learn to fight in armor at Emma, we teach you about how to play inside the box. And what that means is not like the management term of thinking outside the box, but uh, the High Serpent, please. Oh, uh this guy yeah. yeah okay so the box is formed by the wrists the sword the wrists the forearms elbows and upper arms that space whether it's up or down or sideways is the space that you work in with your point with your hilt with any number of things um, these are your grappling tools. So you're going to use the sword as a crowbar that's very sharp and pointy. You're going to put it into either the wrists or the elbow 
to control by using the, five, the four points of the box. And obviously, if you want to off-balance somebody, you're going to use this lever, this set of levers, because as we said earlier, the upper body now has more mass above the shoulders than it's accustomed to dealing with. So instead of having your center of balance at your sternum, you now have it at your throat. So the leverage that you can apply against the arms and the wrists specifically uh, is quite substantial. Making a middle key with your sword hilt, your sword point, your hands and arms like you would in Nabrazari, all of these things work that box. So it's a, a short term um, a shortened term for us to use to teach people to fight in harness. If you're doing this kind of stuff out of harness, your arms are going to be chewed. Hmm. And the cloth isn't going to be able to take any you know, normal fencing jacket. It's not going to be able to take the slicing and pushing and poking. Whereas in armor, eh, that's what it's for. Um, there's a pretty classic uh, complaint about people that have just recently started fighting in armor with, you know, with thrust is that, oh, they're always getting my wrist tied up the bell cuff right well yeah you, if you let go of the sword you let go of your sword the pain stops <laughs> and the case you're free right so the idea is you don't have to hold on to the sword like a monkey you, you mm. hold on to it and when it's useful you let go and grab it again when it's necessary anyway so to carry on um we'll be talking about the box through other sessions and that's the best way yeah. for you to understand it in that illustration yeah awesome right. thank you Kel. thank you please continue all right um yeah put the dependence on it. any any last questions about this one i don't want to linger on this we've, we've already dealt with it a decent amount we're going to deal with it again heavily in polax we will we will all right so maybe let's uh, yeah let's keep going the guard of the archer 33 ra post the sagittarius He's got a bit of a. I can't. Uh, I can't figure out who this guy reminds me of. He reminds me of an actor, some some actor. It's not not Ralph Fiennes, but uh, oh god, it's gonna bug me. Anyways, he's got a little, a little short goatee there. Anyway, uh, <laughs> thirty three R A. Who's next? Connor, would you love like to read the text for us? Second. They call me Posta Sagittaria throw strong thrusts while passing off to any attack or cut coming away I quickly good and immediately deliver my counter this is my art and never depart from it thank you very much Connor all right strong thrust while passing off line okay so So the archer. So perhaps contrary to what you might initially suppose when you look at this for the first time, Fiori doesn't mention throwing the sword from here. Okay, um, we've seen posta or we've seen positions previous that suggest that there might be sword throwing, and even this posta might be cursorily believed to consist of some kind of position apt to throw the sword. It's kind of similar to um, uh, uh, some things we've seen before. But he doesn't mention it in the text. So what's going on here? Um, I know in the in the armor training that I've been privileged to do, post Sagittaria has been described by Brian more as a as a posta to secure se secure the sword high for a thrust that you're gonna um, uh, that you're gonna make and in the text of course he says any attack or cut coming my way I can foil with a good parry and immediately deliver a counter this is my art and I never depart from it he and he gives strong thrusts while passing off line so at least as far as the text is concerned this Posta is similar to Short Serpent in that he parries and thrusts, right? And though it looks a little strange, a little different, um, it's it's not really. Uh, Kel, do you do you put a lot of emphasis on having the sword so 
kind of cocked behind you in um in i think it's the, per the perspective of the the perspective of the uh particular plate here mm -hmm. it doesn't look like this in the in the pd uh, or the morgan um, mm -hmm. the idea that you extend your back arm straight back parallel to your leg as if it were like uh Puerto Longa mm. in reverse is is I think pro a problem. Um, I tend to carry it more out 90 degrees from my body because I see the the position of his hip, how his hips is, is turned, mm. um, and the shoulders line up with the hip. They're not twisted the torso. So in that particular regard, your right hand, of course, will be trailing the body, but not not like drawn way back mm. like that. Uh, so the uh, I think it's uh, in I think it's in the PD. It says it's good for protecting on the right. And to my mind, uh, if you have this out yeah, there, I like this your body, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, much yeah. more like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, having having it out, uh, mm -hmm. angling towards the center, so the hilt is away from the body, and the point stands across the middle. Mm. Uh, your hand is securing uh, the points accuracy mm. the the way you're going to throw the thrust with this as you pass offline is you're going to pound your arms forward almost like you would in high serpent the high serpent's one of those things that you don't really believe how it works until you see somebody do it. Yeah. this one's pretty simple and i believe the reason he calls it the archer and i, I think it's a kind and gentle archer in one of these things and it translates us mm. is really weird to me but um this is a protection this is your shield on your right side so uh, you're going to intercept something that's coming uh, from the uh, backhand uh, uh, dexter reverso. Ball. Mm. a reverso yeah uh, something is coming uh, cast as a reverso at you so it gives you a, a solid cover that's not straight in front of you there's a threat straight in front of you so someone's not going to throw themselves on onto your point any more than they would in short serpent but it gives you additional protection that short serpent does because short serpent is pretty much anchoring your right wrist against your right hip um, in this particular case it's more not a pool cue jab but punching forward with both hands kind of like i guess what you would use as a quarter staff that sort mm -hmm. of thing um, uh, I've, I've heard people say and then and you slide your hand down the sword as you punch it forward uh, uh, which I think is absolute absolute nonsense yeah. and I think it's from people from people that really don't really know anything about armor um, just want. because you, <laughs> yeah you know the whole pool, pool cue stabbing stuff you know, against armor is just oh ridiculous. please yeah yeah, yeah um, okay anyway how this particular uh, posta gives you a defense is because it's out away from your body and as you notice the uh, the figure using it is more likely armored in the in the getty and, and of course the morgan you're not wearing any armor at all so if i had to face someone in trying to swing at me with a pole axe and this is how i was dressed i would want that thing away from my body so i've got a better chance of cutting the arc um, you know like a hockey deep, uh, hockey goalie comes out of the crease to cut down the arc so the player can't shoot as easily it's the same sort of thing whereas you get the weapon out in an arc in front of you but not static in front of you uh, mm. so that they're going to take it and, and it's just slam through it if you tr try to do uh, an overhead crossing like they do in the movies you know mm -hmm. uh, what george silver calls st george's cross if you try to do that with a sword against the pole axe, your sword is going to be destroyed. Yeah. Period. Okay. So, Sagittarius is not as commonly used because I don't think it's particularly well understood. Yeah. But if I am facing someone who's had a couple shots at me from the right hand and suddenly switches to the left hand, um, this is the this is the poster that's going to keep me safe. Yeah. All right. And uh, questions with that, with that, yeah. Any 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 questions about this one? I don't have anything else to add. Uh, Beanie here. I'm tempted to try to draw a comparison to Bicorno. Why? Well, it's not in the center. 
It is provocative, I guess. You're off in your shoulder, but... Uh, a refuse posted to Don is more provocative than post to Breve. Or, or, or uh, post to Bacarno. Mm. Post to Bacarno is, is, uh, stands in the center, has a possible threat, and mm. looks weak. Mm. This one does none of those things. Mm. Yeah, okay. Uh, follow on, uh, separate question. Um, sure, sure. The, the cover is with the point, or are we coming across with the, the pommel in order to come in? The cover's the between point. your hand between your hands. Okay, thank if, you. If you if you cover with the point, you're taking it on your left hand. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Between the, between the hands. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, this is it, this is not a static, um, not a static cover position. You don't stand there and take the blow. You're you're charged. You're uh, you're wound up like a spring ready to uh, pass forward offline and ram your point in. You're going to make your cover and then put whatever you can get online. But passing offline with the rest, the right foot puts you off the center line into a new center line and gives you an opportunity to both make the cover and either strike with the point or reverse it out depending on how you're going to swing um, reverse it out to a pommel hook. It's a very dynamic, very mm -hmm. dynamic defense. Yeah, we're, we're going to get a chance to dip our toe into the plays today, I, I think. Um, we're going to see a little bit about how this sword in two hands is going to be working. right? But of course, we have to do the poses first. And we have one last one to do. Pass across! My favorite. 33RB. No, true cross. We haven't done true cross yet. No, yeah, yeah we did. Yeah, we did. That was this. That was this one. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that you, you thought it was true cross because they're related. <laughs> yeah, this they is the, are. the the bastard. Um, who's next? Graham. Um, I am Posta de Croce Bastarda, uh, the bastard child of the Posta de Vera Croce. Anything I can do, I also like to do. I parry, thrust, and cut well, usually while avoiding attacks offline. I always have a good stock of attacks that I can deliver. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Graham. All right, so I kind of want to get into the place to start getting some context in here, get us thinking, so I don't really want to say too much about this one. The one thing that I think is very curious is this. Um, I parry, you know, anything that uh, True Cross can do, I can do, okay, fine. True Cross is a, is a standard bread and butter play. We're going to see it. Um, we're going to see it, the concept in the plays very clearly. So Bastard Cross can do the same. But he also says, you, I parry Threat and Cust well, usually while voiding attacks offline. That's very curious to me. Now, he doesn't say that very often, uh, if, if at all maybe once or twice in the whole book, talking about voiding, right? So maybe there's something to do with with voiding here uh, in a way that it's not the case with True Cross. I'm not so sure about that, but it's interesting he puts it in the text, right? It is it is there. Uh, but yeah, Bass across with the thumb pointing inside, both the thumbs pointing inside. And Kel already discoursed about that. Do you have anything else to add about this one, Kel? Before yeah, this is, a, this is a mirror for High Serpent. Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, High Serpent would uh, would flow into Bastard Cross on the left, right? High Serpent would be Either out. way. Yeah, that's Either right. Either way. That's right. That's right. Because both of the fingers are inside. That's right. That's right. Thumbs are inside. Thumbs, where I say. Sorry, thumbs. Okay, so um, there we have it. There are the posters of the sword in two hands. Now, you may say to yourself, well, there's only six of them, and there was one. 6 plus 12 of the sword in, uh, in two hands previously, so what gives? Why are there only 6? Well, we have low on the right, high on the right, we have 2 low on the left, we have middle on the right, and we have right in the middle. So we literally have a posta everywhere. <laughs> There's nothing that he's leaving out. Um, we have a position from which we have 
uh, opportunities, which is my sort of soft definition of POSTA. We have a position from, from where we have opportunities in every place that matters. High, low, left, right, and the center. So don't feel like he's left anything out. If anything, the sword in two-hand section is odd for its abundance of POSTA. And no other section in the book gets such an abundance of different POSTA as the sword in two-hand section does. The, the, the sword in one hand, uh, yeah, the sword in one-hand section doesn't even have any POSTA except for, you know, the position of the master, right? So in that respect, the sword in two-hand section is actually the outlier, I, I would submit. Um, but here, Fiori's got everything covered. So with everything covered, and having taken a good look at what, uh, what our starting positions are, we should have an idea of what we're about to see in the plays. So does anybody have any last questions about the post-up before we move on to a couple plays? Yeah. I was very curious, is he avoiding some of the ones, the extra ones, from the Sword in Two Hands without? Like, do you just avoid using those ones once you have the armor on? An excellent question, Amber. Yeah, it's a great question. And, a, and a, lot of, a lot of people in the community that still play in armor, like they've gone on their own way to play in armor, treat... Um, the fight as if it were out of armor and they do a sort of a tournament fight that way where they're you know mm. using the, the the plays and whatnot of the sword uh, out of armor sword and two hand section well there's a big problem with that mm. in that you don't have the strength of defense that you have to deal with in armor and an awful lot of the plays that require any sort of leverage um, you just don't have it when both your hands are on the hill and if you recall, back when we in the sword and tooth intersection, middle iron gate calls for, prefers a long sword, mm. right? So if you mm. have a longer sword in middle iron gate in armor, it's even better because you can reach farther. But the cutting is pointless. You're not going to be able to cut through plate armor. You can bang on somebody. You might dent a piece of armor. You might cut a strap, maybe but it's a low percentage compared to putting a point into them. Mm -hmm. So hmm. it's not so much yeah. that, that he's uh, avoiding the others. These are, so this is a particular subset of techniques and postas to deal with the presence of armor. Yeah. It's not a, another yeah. kind of fighting. It's just a subset of what you already know because as we see in the plays that follow in different weapons, a lot of the similar plays keep cropping up. Middle key keeps cropping up all over the place. Anyways, it's a good question, Amber, and I'm glad you asked. Yeah, and you know, uh, it's it, it is the same art as Kel said, but um, you know, we we did talk about yes, I think last last time we met, we talked about how celeritas uh, means just enough, you know, um, in, in in armor, energy conservation is even more important than it is, or it's even more critical to do than it is out of armor. Not to say it's not critical to do out of armor, but you know, you don't necessarily have the, you know, it's not necessarily the time to do all of your Largo, you know, yeah. to do your Largo fight. Sometimes it's time to, you know, be in these conservative positions with two hands on the sword, you know, only do just enough and, and, that may mean that your fight in armor does not look like your fight out of armor. I think that's almost certainly the case, personally. Yeah. yeah. You're, the, the fact of the matter is armor is a huge drag on your battery of energy. Yeah. Uh, you start a fight with a certain amount of energy, with a, you know, just getting out of out of um, distance and getting a couple breaths in, in uh, sort of two-hand section. Yeah, that's that's the way you can you know keep right. energy going. Right. Your energy is being sapped every moment you're wearing this kit. I mean, it's not that it's enormously heavy. It's the standard load that men have carried since the mm. dawn of time as warriors or, or as working people. Um, it's a, yeah, a standard Italian Milanese plate setup like these guys are wearing is going to weigh around 30 kilos. Standard uh, field load for uh, modern infantrymen is about 30 kilos. The standard load for a Roman
Roman legionary mm. uh, 2,000 years ago was about 30 kilos of all the stuff he had to carry. Odd. How strange, eh? And mm. It always seems to be around that same thing. Mm. You know, obviously someone is, is, is in a tournament is going to be wearing an awful lot heavier armor than it would be on their upper body. So they're not going to be that agile on their feet once they get off the horse because the horse is their feet's agility. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you when you look at uh, somebody that's a, a specialist, uh, say an airborne ranger or whatever, you're jumping with usually almost half your body weight attached to you as well, and then you know it's very very uncomfortable because it's not spread evenly over your body. Whereas armor it is spread evenly over your body. You're not carrying it in a backpack. It's an exoskeleton. So um, it does tire you out, but it's much more manageable than a lot of other types of loads you might have to carry in different uh, fields. I I have a question of uh, following. I'm sorry, Amber, is that that's your name? Oh, yeah. and she's yeah, muted anyway. Amber, yeah. um, okay. Uh, she was asking about using the um, uh, the the unarmored posta, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 Kel, you said these you would switch to these. Um, partially because of the sorts of things you'd be doing against an opponent in armor. Right. Um, would that go in the other direction? If you were you know, unarmored versus armor, would you switch to some of these more forceful thrusts and, and no. leverage? No. no? Or are they just too unsafe because of the other stuff? Too risky because you're okay. armored you have no armor. Um, okay. You would try to use uh, longer range plays because you're going to be dealing with someone yeah. who's typically going to have it tightened up. But the sad part is, um, if they're in armor and you're not, and they still have the knowledge of armor, sorry, <laughs> you're not in good. You're not in a good place. You're in fucking trouble. Is, it's not, not going <laughs> to go well for you because they yeah. can do all of the same stuff you can. Yeah. The only the only poster that's really difficult in harness is finastra. Um, mm. All the rest of them are, you know, you can do all that stuff, and that's why these tournament players, these people like. Uh, you know, Sean Hayes and Christian Cameron and all these It's recorded. Well, I guess it's okay because well, we have, well, we've had this conversation directly many mm -hmm. times. Um, their, their way of looking at it is, why can't we do that? And we're just having fun. And that's absolutely valid. Not of any interest to me, but it's absolutely <laughs> valid because what um, Fiori's showing is to fight for your life, you know, uh, whether it's in battle, or, or whether it's in some sort of civil disturbance or protecting your city. Because remember, Italy didn't, wasn't a country, it was a region full of city-states that were constantly at war with each other. And uh, Fiore was a condiciere earlier in his life where he wouldn't have made the reputation that he did. Um, trying to fight someone in armor when you are not in armor, you're really much better off with a couple of friends with spears than yeah. to even bother trying to take on a guy in armor. Um, you can get two people or three people with spears, you can take down somebody in armor, at least one of them. Uh, but if you have to fight one-on-one -on -one against someone in armor and you're not and you're not armored, you, you, you just, you know, you're going to, as Shuri says, you're going to see the sign, the sign of the cross and the, and the entrance to heaven or, or whatever purgatory. Yeah. It's yes, just yeah. not 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 really feasible because uh, people say, "Oh, well, armored swords aren't sharp." That's nonsense. That's a tournament sword that isn't sharp, except at the tip. Mm -hmm. um, these swords are are perfectly sharp because only ten percent of the people you'll find on a given battlefield are going to wear anything approaching full armor. Uh, the vast majority of them all have a few armored pieces, so you can hack off limbs and. And cut open skulls and things like that against the vast majority of infantry you deal with. But when you run up against another nobleman who might be wearing even better armor than you are, you better have the skills. Yeah, get friends. Don't <laughs> don't, yeah. don't don't get into struggle with these guys. Get friends. Is uh, you know yeah. I agree a thousand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and 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 that's also something that we should we should mention. Uh, we're drifting towards the plays. Um, we'll we'll get a couple of them here, but just as a little overview. We're going to look at, well, how many places? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, sixteen. So there's actually six. There's as many plays in here as there is in the wrestling section, which is really great. Um, eighteen. Eighteen. Oh, is there eighteen? Yeah. No, in the, no, in the, in the, uh, the wrestling section. is sixteen. Oh, uh, eighteen. I see, I see. 
but yeah, but see, all of these plays are. Um, I'm going to say something controversial. They're in stretto. Now, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to recall us back to the Largo Stretto debates and whatever, but all of these plays that we're going to see in here are done in close, where, 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 where grappling is possible, right? Where Abrazari is an element, as opposed to in the true Largo range of the sword and two hands where the fight is at the tips, okay? And so to, to you know, answer your question, uh, Gwyn, an unarmored fighter against an armored fighter doing this stuff that Fiora is talking about is going to be submitting themselves to fighting in stretto with the armored uh, uh, combatant. And as Kel said, that is a very bad decision, right? That that is not an equal. Uh, it's not an equalizer, right? It's not just the using the sword in two hands that makes uh, these guys equal. It's that they're using the sword in two hands and they're in armor, right? Being unarmored here would be a terrible disadvantage uh, uh, to, uh, to the person. So, um, I mean, yes, you could try, right? But yeah, better better get friends for sure. Uh, but you know, the art's good to know, right? There's nothing there's nothing wrong with you know knowing what to do even if you're you are out of armor here. Um, all right, do we answer your question, uh, Gwen? Yeah, yeah, make some sort of joke about, you know, you're not in armor, so you can leave faster or something like that. But yeah, <laughs> you, you gave me a great yeah. answer. Thank yeah. you. Great. Awesome. Thank you. All right, anybody else before we move on to the plays? All right. Cool, great. So we're making great time and progress in this session today. So we've gone, we've done our little, um, we've contextualized a bit what armor is. Um, what we're going to be looking at here in the book. Um, this is just to briefly summarize before we get into the, uh, the, the plays. So we started off today looking at the second half of the book, right, which is all in armor and with the equestrian section. Um, uh, we summarized what it means to be in armor a bit, what are some things that change, what are some things that don't, and then we've looked at the first section of the, uh, this second half of the book, which is the sword in two hands. And we looked at um, the six posta of the sword in two hands in armor. And now we're looking at the plays. So let's get into the plays. We'll do a few and then we're, we'll all be almost done. So the first master of the sword in uh, armor, folio 33RC. Here we go. All right, um, Gwyn, would you like to read the text for us? Sure. Uh, I come out of the Posta de Veracross with this parry while passing obliquely offline. What I can do from this parry, I can easily show through my students as they complete my plays. Those who fight to the bitter end will surely, surely show their art. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. 33 RC. So... He says he, he came out of True Cross with this parry and passing obliquely offline. And what he can do as a result of this, he's going to uh, show through his students. So let's take a moment to check out what's going on here. So um, as a brief summary, this play is super important because this is the general trend of how we're going to deal with uh, fighting an armored opponent with a sword in armor, with us armored with a sword in armor, is what Fiore said, cover, uh, pass, and then strike. So all of these plays that follow are going to fo uh, follow that more or less order, right? Cover, pass, and then strike. And what what plays you have available... Stop, 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 stop. Sorry? Mm -hmm. He said, he says pass, cover, and strike. And that's critical to the timing of the first play. And I know you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to be silver-esque there, but it's not what he says. It's important that you do it in the order. Your pass puts you into the cover, 
continuing through the cover puts you into the camera. Ah, ah I see. I see. Okay. So okay. Don't, there, you, you can't make the cover without passing. Okay. You have to pass to make the cover. Okay, great. Thank you for that for that clarification. So um, so there that is, right? Passing, covering, and striking. And just like with with Stretto, and just like with every Thing we've looked at before what you have available uh, or sorry what you what you do depends on what you have available right depends on the nature of the engagement so when we looked at the sword before um, when we looked at Largo and Stretto out of armor we um, of course made the simple observation that the um, oh, whoops anyways it doesn't matter that the human body you know, can be bisected both ways. So there's an, there's an upper and a lower part, and there's a left side and a right side, right? So what you have available to you is gonna depend on whether or not you have closed in on the left side or the right side, and whether or not the opening that you've created or that's been given to you is high or low. Very simple, right? Well, in most cases, it's gonna be high. But We'll, we'll see. So here we have the first master. Um, he's made the cover and the pass, and then his students are going to follow and do do the things. All right. Um, anybody have anything to add there? No. Okay. So let's let's see a couple of these things before we finish for the day. Folio thirty three R D. All right. Uh, Kel, would you like to read this text for us? I'm going to read from the second edition. Okay. <clears throat> I'm the first student of the master just before me, and I deliver this thrust straight from the parry. The same thrust can also come out of opposte de vera croce e poste de croce bastarda. As the opponent attacks with a thrust, the master or student who is placed in one of these guards or poste should lower his body and pass offline, crossing the opponent's sword in which a point high against his face or chest. And, as shown here, the hilt needs to be kept low while doing this. Thank you very a much, Kevin. A lot oh, of information here. That's a, that's a really important bit of text, isn't it? Holy crap. All right. So, if you've ever um, done any classes with Kel in, in, in armor, um, uh, or doing the plays in armor with, you know, the axe uh, or with the sword or whatever. These motions are super critical to this whole this whole thing we got going on here. Okay, and it's amazing that Fiore has told us this because this is super specific, right? We didn't really get a lot of this stuff uh, very often in the sword uh, in the previous sections, right? So this is super specific. As the opponent attacks with a thrust. Master or student who is placed in uh, one of these guards, right, whatever, should lower his body and pass offline, crossing the opponent's sword with the point high against his face or chest. So, lower his body. So, let's just say he's in true cross. Cross is a very deep stance to begin with. Yeah. And it's very deep, and he's going to lower it even more. Not necessarily a lot, but a little is a lot, right? A little is a lot in martial arts. Yeah. Lowering That's his body. Why, yeah. Mm -hmm. By widening your, your base, mm -hmm. passing offline with a wide base, uh, you've got an awful lot of structure. It's pretty hard to knock you over uh, and it, because you're moving forward and you're low to the ground. The second thing this does is... When you take your body low, it brings your head down as well. That's right. So if someone's foolishly cutting at you, the chances of being hit in the face are almost zero. And, oddly enough, the first scholar has no head protection. That's right. He does not. Boom. He's got wonderful curly, curly locks. Just like oh, all, uh, no. just like Anthony's kids. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, so already being in a deep stance, lowering your body even further, right? Lowering it further um, and passing offline. 
So, and again, uh, thank you, Kel, for that clarification. Passing offline, then crossing the opponent's sword with a point high against his face or chest. And as shown here, the hilt needs to be kept low. So not in high serpent, right, where the hilt is high. And so we, we see this action, you know, partially done here. And we see it fully done here where the the, the follow-on is, is is completed so he's picked up the he's picked up the attack he successfully passed it and now he's effectively suppressing it and in in uh, out of armor we call this a thrust in opposition or we call this kind of engagement and an, an engagement thrust in opposition. Hmm? counter thrust in opposition yeah a, a counter thrust in opposition so he's got direct you have a direct touch on the enemy sword, so you know where it is, a thousand percent. You can feel it moving, whether it stays there or not. And your point is online. And that this is the position that you're going to deliver your thrust uh, uh, to them. So in, in a very interesting way, it's something super boring that we've already know very well, but it's in a totally unique and different context. So it's a thrust in opposition, but in stretto, in armor, with two with a the sword um, with both your hands on different parts of the sword. So again, there's a theme, right? Something familiar with something a little new. And this thrust is a doozy, right? This is a thrust that almost killed one of us uh, five or six years. Well, no, no, it was longer than that. Two thousand eight. Two thousand eight. Yeah. yeah Matt, Matt, Matt McKee almost died from it. Yeah. But then Matt McKee was also doing something that he has yeah. since found uh, he will never do again. <laughs> it was a, re a regrettable uh, sort of attacks it was. that he was throwing at Matt Brundle, and Matt Brundle did exactly this play. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, even the bluntest tips go through Gambison because uh, Matt McKee yeah. had loosened his armor during a break and hadn't tied it back up correctly, and therefore his uh, his uh, right arm same, was yeah. on. Yeah, his mm -hmm. sleeve was uh, uncovered. He caught it inside and almost uh, punctured the brachial artery. Yeah, it's crazy. It was not a good that. scene. And then, of course, uh, what's that thing about Mason, the, uh, the guy, or, or the liaison with the ROM standing out there, blood, blood, more blood. I remember the kids in the front row, the kids are like, stum, stum, stum. <laughs> mommy, mommy, is that real blood? No, I don't think so, honey. That would be grossly irresponsible and terrible. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, it was you know, it was like another half oh, hour we got before Matt so even hard. noticed. You know, oh man, oh, Matt good didn't even notice. Um, in any case, yeah. uh, Matt Matt uh, Brundle uh, was very good at this. He really practiced his play a lot, huh. and, yeah. and he had a good solid hold on it. Um, I would I would like to say that if you are watching armored tapes of Emma uh, fighting in harness. We have a safety convention that uh, yeah. is, is exactly to stop this type of thing because a, a shot can slide up your breastplate under your avon tail and into your throat yeah. uh, or under your jaw very, very easily from this position. It's quite deadly and, and, and well, it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. The problem is uh, to do that safely with uh, playmates, we have a convention at Emma that when you make a thrust like this, lift your back hand you lift your right hand up to shoulder high so it's not like you have to come down from above your head but you have to lift your hand up to at least a couch position this flattens out the point so it doesn't uh, penetrate up into armor as easily it'll pop out on the armor yeah. and uh, so any of you that are watching and go well that's not what we do that's not what our scholars do well that's why there's a convention because none of us want to kill each other you know, most of the time. Reason. That's right. No, no, no. I never want to kill right. any of you. A couple of times I wanted to break your arm, but you know. <laughs> well, all right. Actually start talking. Anyways. And with that, let's look at one last one. Um, we'll get a bit of more fury sass, and then we'll. Uh, we should be able. We should be able to do the two of them. We should be able to do okay. two. Uh, these these last two. I okay. just had sure. one question. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, 
when it's talking about lowering the body, when exactly is that done? Is that done just mm -hmm. before? Like, is that part of the movement? When yes, is that is. actually accomplished? Great question. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's an excellent question, and it's hard to tell from these images. Yeah. I think if, if the image just before this was uh, True Cross, if you were in True Cross and you looked at it, this is a 180 degree reversal of, of the image. So the true cross position would have the fighter on the left with his right, refused. his left foot refused and have it back and he'd have the palm up forward, right? So when you come out of this, you slip your forward foot, which is your right foot, a little bit off the line, just like we do with the dagger, and you, you slip a little bit off the line, and then use that pivot and pass offline even more. So you're now leaving the center of the line of attack. You're now getting to your left of the incoming blow. Against the thrust, it's even more critical that you get offline. So this is avoiding, really. Mm. But you also swing the sword forward and up as you take your body down. So it becomes a bridge for you to hide under. Mm. It keeps the top of your head safe. Right, so your arms are extended high, and you can see it here where now he stood up um, on the image on the right. That Aaron's got all the little arrows on, he's come back up again because he's recovered from his pass. Right? Yeah, and we're not talking about a duck walk here, like it's not that low, mm -hmm. but you take your body down a bit, you don't charge head first into the attack, literally with your face, you take your body down and swing your hands up as you're passing. And you will connect in this crossing. Sometimes it's almost a 90 degree crossing, but you're still trying to sweep the sword to your right, from your left to your right, to clear that center line. Mm -hmm. Your offline pass gives you some uh, clearance, and then your cover gives you complete clearance. And as you turn through this, you take your hilt lower, or your uh, right hand lower with the hilt in it. And the point comes forward and into their playmate's face or throat. This is not a play to stab someone in under the arm with. It's pretty hard to do that. But uh, does that answer your question? Or did I lose yeah. you completely? It's okay? No, that definitely makes sense. It does think... make sense? It does. It does. It does. Oh, it does. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, totally makes yeah, I actually think when we when we teach, um, of course, it was a year ago, but <laughs> when we teach Voltas Stabiles in class, we often advocate people to bend their knees a bit, to bend, uh, to, to, to lower their center of gravity into the Voltas Stabile in order to make sure that they're pressing their weight into the earth to reinforce the connection to the earth rather than, you know, having uh, everything be super, super tall, right, and, and away from the earth. And, and this is really, this is a Volta Stabile, what he's doing, but he's just doing uh -huh. the bend a little teeny bit more, right? A, lo a little is a lot, remember, right? So he's not really doing anything crazy different, but it's doing a little more stable, a little more fortitudo in that Stabile um, to facilitate uh, uh, this action. Mm -hmm. Check the pass. Uh, well, well uh, a, a turn it and a pass. Uh, I would, I would say, but, but sure, maybe just a, it's, a, it's a pass there. Um, anyway, all right. Okay, let's look at these at these next two uh, posts here. So, uh, plays. Sorry, Can I we... also have a question oh, before please. we move on. Yep, yep, yep. yep, yep. <laughs> and it's about uh, it's about the left hand on the sword. Well, he starts in uh, true cross, mm -hmm. left thumb towards the tip. Mm -hmm. As he comes out to make the cover, now he has the thumbs pointing towards each other. He does the follow on thrust, thumb is toward the tip again. Do you really change your thumb twice during the, when you're carrying out this play? No, okay. no this, is, this is one of the, uh, one of the many small uh, mistakes in the artwork of the yeah. Getty. Um, okay. People treat the Getty as, as if it's, uh, you know, the Bible. Mm. And it is uh, really, really deep and powerful manuscript filled with tons of information but the artists that did it aren't necessarily um, accurate in every single little detail this was uh, 
Royal, Main, uh, Royal Armory's manuscript 133. And we had the priest, you know, commenting on it afterwards. And he goes, oh, yeah, and the artist has drawn this wrong. This isn't really supposed to happen this way. Well, Fiore never does that in this presentation copy. Because I think that, that he already directed it, but I don't, I don't think that he uh, had every single piece of it drawn while he was standing there. I think he set up players to pose for it, and uh, then they, they had a, another artist, because this is, this is pretty high-end humanist art. Mm. Anyway, it's is a, a very valid question, though. Yeah, it's a great observation as well, because, of course, this, this thumb is in... Looks like it's coming from Vassar Cross in here, but the text says that it's coming from True. True, yeah. Right, and so uh, and so this is why this whole time in this book, uh, we've been reflecting on the very necessary problem of text versus images, because there are many times where we, as Fiori students, we leaned heavily on the image to help us inf uh, to help inform us what we were doing uh, and, and where we were going. But there's also some times where we lean more heavily on the text, um, and and so there's there's this there's this tension throughout the book with the text and the images. And in this particular case, where the text and images conflict, um, I, and I agree with Cal completely that it seems to me that the text is more authoritative. Yeah. Not that it's a big it's big it's not different per se. However, but it's, you know, yeah. if you if you did this play, yeah from Bastard Cross, this is the way it ends. Right. And exactly. as he says, is that against a thrust I can, you know, against a thrust I can uh, either from Bastard Cross or from True Cross do the exactly. same thing. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the re reason I'm asking is up until now, looking at these illustrations, and the way he seems to switch the thumb freely, I took it as an indication that it doesn't really matter which direction the thumb is until, Kel, you gave your exposition about the difference between the two and how the thumbs toward each other is stronger for covers. So that's you know, something I'm going to have to keep in mind. Uh, not only for covers, but for leverage. Mm -hmm. If you want to hook someone behind the neck and you do it with your, your thumb forward, you can push and pull, but you don't have anywhere near the leverage as what your thumbs are both in. Okay. okay. Something to keep in mind. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Andrew, we're going to see that more. You'll see uh, it next with, week. Yeah, next week when we do some of these, yeah, some of these follow you'll, you'll really see it. Yeah. But with that stout thrust there, that point control, that thumb towards the point is uh, brutal. It's a good, it's a good one. Um, okay, excellent. Excellent stuff. Um, all right. Well, maybe it is 10 o'clock, of course. We just had some excellent questions. Maybe this is a good time to pause and because uh, I have kept you uh, for two hours. Are there any other questions so far about anything that we've talked about? No? Okay. Well, um, then... Oh, we, did, we did have a lot of good questions, and I thank you all. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Um, I'm super, super excited we're actually here. Um, 20 weeks ago, this seemed like, a, you know, a, a very tall order to actually get walk step by step to the second half of, of Fiore and get to the armor section, but uh, I, I, I'm i sure we're going to be able to finish Fiore, uh, finish the Getty in its entirety before um, we're back into the cell. And of course this is recorded, so we're going to have it after that, and then uh, we're going to continue on to body. So we're making excellent progress, and it's amazing what you can do one week at a time. Um, so Kel, as always, thank you very, very much for, for coming and offering your wisdom. It's um, very much appreciated. My pleasure. I look forward to it every week. Yeah, and, and everybody else, thank you very much for, for coming. This will be up on uh, YouTube in a few days uh, at most. And um, yeah, if you have any other questions, if you uh, remember some, please save them and bring them up uh, next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Thanks, Aaron. Good night, folks. Have a great night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Good night.